Hello chess enthusiasts, it's time to continue our Alakine's Defense Odyssey. Four Pawns Attack variation we're going to be discussing now with a game in between two very strong grandmasters. We're talking about Vesel and Topalov and Christian Bauer. Now, when I've chosen the game that I'm going to uh, talk about with you guys is, um, you know, I was scrolling down the archive and I just, uh, something, um, you know, appeared in my uh, in front of my eyes saying that Chalon en Champagne. And I said, that's it, that's it, I'm going to choose this one amongst all the games that have, have been played by various strong players. That one particularly retained my attention. I must be sensitive when it's about the vineyards and their wonderful product. So I said, that's it, it's going to be Chalon en Champagne. I would play chess any time in Chalon en Champagne. You know, if it's about this. Well, I love coffee very much too. I don't know if I would have a red uh, large before or after the coffee or before or after the game, but definitely that's a must go. Hopefully one day. So now let's go to uh, be seeing this game together, guys. A lot of ideas will be uh, circulating at the minute now. So let's just do this. E4. <clears throat> so we're playing knight f6. Uh, Tempting the pawn to coming down, hunting our black knight. Now we're just going to jump around. And as I said in the first part of our uh, uh, series now about dedicated to the Alakai's defense, it's one of those openings in which you actually get to move the knight perhaps four times or maybe even more. And I know normally you get to say to uh, younger players or the people that just start learning the game, don't play twice the same piece in the opening. But in the other kind, we got the major exception, the, 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 the most exceptional exception of them all. You're going to play that knight a lot. So d6 is being seen as the main uh, pawn breaker. You're going to do d6 sometimes, it's going to be c5. But we're going to see this one a bit later. So C4 now really forcing your knight to be moved on B6. And F4. Very ambitious. F4. Uh, take a lot of space in the center. Complete the minion by the white pawn now. Uh, if you really want to be super funky, I assume you may be investigating H5 and Bishop G4 type of game here. But I'm personally more keen on developing G6, playing this fianchetto. Because really really want to get my bishop on g7 and this is just beautiful you know it resembles with the, um, the dragon the sicilian dragon which i played it every now and then but i'm really very much in love with the g6 and bishop g7 type of structure i think it's just superb i love it knight c3 bishop g7 and bishop e3 nothing wrong we are just developing our pieces now theoretical approach here bishop e6 now that's very interesting and it, there, there are some subtleties here. I just like to make it known to you, my friends. And the subtlety is the bishop on e6, knight on b6, uh, attack on c4. That might be very direct, you might say. What's the subtlety? The subtlety is you want to tempt your opponent to pushing d5. And although it looks like they will be getting even more space from black, the fact that you'll be repositioning your bishop onto f5 or perhaps on c8 then weakening the e5 which you will attack in the future in the near future with moves like knight c6 knight to d7 and you'll be attacking this pawn on e5 three times and i'm not quite sure exactly how white is gonna master three pieces to look after that pawn which currently is just defended by this guy so these are the subtleties you really want to make white push the pawns far away further astray so they would be perhaps more difficult to being protected by pieces. So the unorthodox Alakine defense um, proposes a way for black to play and making white pushing the pawns far away, opening up the lines, thus the white king could potentially be more attackable. But especially the white pawns can be then easily challenged with moves like d6, knight e6, knight e7u, which is going to try to attack that center persistently. Let's continue now. b3, one move. Again, if white commits to d5, you're either going to go on f5 or you're going to drop them back on c8. And they are very, these are very good lines. Okay, so the, uh, the other kind of defense, by the way, is being played at the highest level by various grandmasters. Uh, Carlson and Nakamura, they played it. 
okay, and many others, okay, so this is a very, very uh, reliable way to be playing with black here. Okay, uh, disregard this thing. This is a theoretical move with castling. So the question mark and the exclamation, maybe the almighty engine in its omniscience probably uh, might be considering it's, it's not the strongest take, but I'm telling you it's a theoretical approach and there's nothing bad in itself, especially from a human point of view, because we are assuming we're going to play human versus human. If you're going to play the engine, probably you're going to lose every single time. So taking now in the center and takes and c5 another pawn breaking in the other kind guys this guy is seriously weakened okay and the c5 just simply puts the question to the pawn here what are you gonna do you're gonna take thus this guy will be completely hanging or you want to push d5 so that's that that's a very interesting very sharp double-edged opening this is not an easy opening this is very very convoluted there are many versions of nine so i'm just trying to taking them one by one now we're going to stop upon the four pawns variation d5 you're taking a hell out of space here uh i mean white has complete dominance over the center bishop to f5 a rook now to c1 because mainly as soon as this guy is being taken, the knight on c3 is practically hanging, guys. So, why not just play rook on uh, c1 at the same time, moving away the rook from this very nasty pin. So, moving the rook to safety, supporting your knight at the minute, and, you know, it is what it is. You just keep playing this position. Knight to a6. Yes, it's a peripheral one, but given the fact that you might be having some possibilities around c7 and b4 squares, is perfectly playable. Plus, plays a defensive role here. It just simply protects c5. So they developed, sorry, they developed the knight and they had protected c5. With the bonus that you might be jumping around with the knight, as we know they are very versatile. Knight to f3. Incredibly important, especially at the highest level, you've got to develop your stuff, uh, my chess friends. Knight and bishop, just get them out and try and put your king to safety. Now, slightly readjusting of the knight on b6, goes on d7, double attack on this guy here on e5. Twice being attacked. Now, white gives away of targeting the pawn and focusing on, focuses on protecting the white pawn on e5. Queen goes on b8. That's one option here. Three times attacking here. And if you wonder, well, what if I just push the pawn? Well, the bishop actually is hanging behind them. So queen will just simply take this bishop there. Uh, yeah, and if you take this guy, then actually I'm going to take it back with the bishop. So white didn't want to do this. So they pushed forward. Look at this nice uh, uh, intrusion here on the d file with a passed pawn oh my day so this is a very sharp um, opening guys and it may result in something as you can witness right now knight to b4 as we discussed previously this knight is very versatile knights are uh, incredibly jumpy and they could just go places okay so you got some uh, uh, very nicely positioned knight here that controls all those uh, highlighted squares a3 kicking the knight away and knight goes back nicely on to c6 also you have this square here which you control it three times look at this two knights and a bishop so this square is good to be exploited when you consider so it's something to keep in mind castles now eventually white chooses to castle the king you can't keep the king on castle forever not with the e file where probably black's gonna play a rook any second now so you probably you may want to castle that king <clears throat> queen goes away just try this probably they're just trying to finding some ways i reckon if you just watch this things here it could be amongst other things maybe queen f6 maybe queen a5 these are all possibilities exploitable by the blacks here Knight jumps on d5. Uh, both of them played a magnificent game with high level of accuracy. So you are seeing here, guys, an incredibly accurately played game of chess. Both Topalov and Bauer 
uh, played a magnificent game and they rightfully so ended up in a draw but just wanted you guys to witness the beauty of the game they played so now they made the pin so maybe the engine might say there was something better here to to be played by white but perhaps a rook perhaps a rook on the e file but the pin is absolutely very much to do because a pin is a pin and you're playing against the human and this knight practically now is unplayable so you need to uh be very careful about that one h6 trying to break the pin and perhaps to take any future attempts from the white pieces I deny to bishop to station on the g5. This guy is sort of hanging. Maybe when the engine said this one was a dubious move, what what it did have uh, in evaluation is that the d6 pawn is hanging, so to speak. But I'm not quite sure how much of a hanging because if we took, probably we are facing a knight on e7. I just wonder. Let me just see if the engine would agree with that one. So bishop, okay, h6. So I think that would be that would be a terrible, terrible, terrible bad move here. And I think that's the case exactly. That's a disaster, especially after knight f6. This guy is completely hanging. We're gonna lose. We're gonna lose monumentally here. So that's not quite hanging. Not quite hanging here. But he did take on f6. Bishop takes and now Bishop collects the pawn on h6. Rook must move, goes on e8. So it's very desirable to just placing your rooks on open files every single time you have a chance. Now, but this, it's, you know, it's like a thorn in the back. This pawn here is something that black needs to be dealing with for some time. And the bishop retreats back to keep the protection for that pawn. Rook very nicely, uh, sorry, the bishop very nicely uh, launches on b2, targeting the rook on c1 and the white pawn on a3 here. So you can't have them all. White considers, okay, if you want to take my rook, just take it now, because the battery of the queen and the bishop along the dark squares is really something for black to ponder over. I mean, when you're giving up on this bishop, you got to be aware. Uh, white will be taking back but you're giving away all the dark squares and that could be incredibly critical so this is something you really need to assess uh, if you really want to give away give up on that bishop on a dark squares so that is why they just decided rather than taking he decided to play queen f6 supporting the bishop maintaining the attack and accepting that actually queen's presence on the dark square would be more beneficial in terms of defensive in terms of defending attacking the queen now and attacking the other queen on f6 you know it's pound for pound you know these guys are fighting and takes and takes what we do see here is that this bishop is really really completely reigning supreme on the dark squares and the rook here supports the pawn and this is not a situation in which you might be incredibly comfortable question is if you are able to finding a way to shut off this rook maybe protecting the pawn so let's see how the game evolves first thing first we have the check king had to move rook now attacks simultaneously the bishop and puts a bit more pressure on that pawn the uh, bishop runs away and now we are playing black plays a move that actually attacks twice the pawn and of course you want to make it uh, you want to make it very messy here and if possible you know probably white would be dreaming to just uh, you know opening up the lines the g file and making the black king even more exposed so probably that's that's that that's the idea behind bishop on d3 takes and takes and now finally i think i think black was incredibly relieved when black was able to actually take the d6 pass pawn i think that was like you know like a, 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 a fresh air for black's defenses here because that pawn was really really a major headache for black takes now now here it is there is another there is another pass pawn knight plays okay so he wants to simplify so I guess here Bauer simply wanting to simplify things, clarify, make it easily defendable. You know, you just try to make this defendable. Uh, F6 being played here. G4. 
and now he blocked. Now I wonder if we could do something else with black here. Doesn't look like very obvious. So g5 trying to dismantling that pawn structure on the king side and takes and pawn goes forward and takes and this guy seriously seriously coming down black is having those two pawns on the king side and these are also quite 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 dangerous if you manage given a chance not now because by playing now probably this guy is going to be taken although you're going to be taking the other pawn back and very soon boys and girls this this game will be ending up in a draw they had agreed to be playing a draw now that bishop sacrifice means that these guys will be supported perhaps by the rook which comes on the third rank here and would be able to actually uh, attacking those pawns so if you push this guy probably the other guy is going to be taken and these guys are dangerously you know coming down perhaps some checks and they had agreed upon a draw and this game check so yeah the game didn't continue for too long the last game white had played here topalov played here was king to g2 and now they had agreed both of players had agreed to uh, make it a draw practically the compensation is these two guys are on the king side supported by the rook the rook also will be able to probably take on b3 or a3 and the other two black pawns would be free to be marching down but it but this is an arduous long ending and highly risky so now you just agree upon a draw even the engine considers that is a 0, 0.00 as evaluation so guys the four pawns attack with the main ideas in the opening so you're just obviously jumping with the knight you're going to be playing g6 that's my that's my personal preference here and bishop g7 fianchetto and bishop to e6 starting already to um uh chipping at the pawn uh, white pawn uh wall here white pawns and normally is the b3 being played b3 is being played here yes they might be pushing the d5 again don't get too scared about the d5 choosing between the bishop f5 or bishop c8 and then you should be able guys to start uh, making the trade onto e5 especially if you play a knight uh and attacking more three times on that particular pawn depends on what white chooses to do so in this game that we've seen here let me just see it's okay so after bishop e6 they played uh b3 then please do castle it's not a problem this is a theoretical approach here so just castle the king not a problem whatsoever and uh, keep developing your stuff and c5 another pawn uh breaking move that you may want to consider here so guys that's the four pawn illustrative game that i've chosen um probably i should have a large red after this game or maybe a coffee okay so uh, i'd leave this one as an option for you to my chess friends and i will be continuing with uh, other variations in the other kind defense let me know if you play this yourselves let me know what you play against the e4 in the comments below and um Maybe we'll be doing some videos on your preferred um, defenses. So uh, let me know, guys. And thank you very much for your time. I'll see you soon.